before you. Um, they both deal with the issue of plan equivalency. I don't know if Damien has given you those. I will give them to them momentarily. And I see, I'm just looking at um, a notice requirement, education and outreach. And I don't know how many of these are the packet for you. A, re, a reopener and audit language. <coughs> and I guess we're going to hold off on this one for now. Yeah. Um, the other section is not ready for prime time yet from our perspective. Um, and you don't have, do you have a? Um, so you, you have, have two. I have all these. Okay. You I, have think we, I think Damien put them in a little pile. Okay. Right. You so, have you have you have two for us, which is Senate proposal regarding determination of alternative plan equivalency, and a Senate proposal regarding state VSA plan equivalency. Is that right? We have Those five things. exactly. And we um, have, you have five, but but several of them are not raised to prime time. Okay. So what we're going to talk about right now are the House proposed notice requirements. Do you yes. see that? Yep. yep. House proposed changes to reopener language. Yep. 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 And House proposed changes to audit language. Yes. And we're not, um, we so. had a misunderstanding about the issue regarding um, qualifications. And so we I just want to clarify before we, um, we want to clarify that before we move forward on that conversation. Okay. So okay. we just, the Sounds good. three of us contacted and we're, We'll settle that, but let's. So we have five amendments then, right now. Three, two, three, the three house. Three house, two Senate. Senate. Yeah. I, I don't Martin, see the Senate. Why don't you go first on the, the house the ones? Senate ones with paper clipped. If I could interrupt, uh, Mr. Chair. We only have Joyce until 4:30. Mm. Um, so if there are financial questions, the committee may want to ask her. And then the the only other question uh, is whether I should ask the editors to stay late tonight? Um, I, don't or th I don't think it's necessary. Okay. But they should be here early in the morning. Sounds <laughs> good. They're always <laughs> here early in the morning. Um, all right. And, and do, you, do you want to go first, Tom? Do any of these, first? none of these address the effective dates of the PIA, of the, of the. Oh, yeah, I, I sent that. that. We'll do that. Okay. I yeah. said a little chart. Okay. I, I saw the chart. We haven't um, discussed it. I there so. are so many dates that need to change throughout yeah. the draft that I'm going to hold off on that until the conference committee has agreed on dates, and then I'll make the changes throughout. Okay. So. Are we, uh, who, who presents first? Well, before I go to that, I, I do think that if we can, um, uh, for the next time that we meet, if we have a little chart of the dates for our conversation, uh, because when Representative Shai and I went through all the dates, it was helpful to just conceptualize the difference between the last bill and this bill. Um, mm -hmm. So I think as part of the conversation, yeah. that would be helpful. And, and we didn't have 100% of the dates, but we had the major yeah, just pieces of the process. Yeah. And right. So, so that we will have that start. ready for tomorrow morning. For tomorrow yeah. morning. Yeah. I'm um, thinking uh, we have until 10. I would think it would be safe to meet at 8.30 and wrap this up. That's fine with me. We just have to make sure. We may we have to wait for the printers to come back, but I think we can no, shake we hands. Can, we can conceivably aim for that, absolutely. Right. And okay. um, um, so 8.30 tomorrow morning, we can set that so we don't have to right. race at the end of the day right. today. So 8.30 right. tomorrow morning is fine. All right, you'll be here. You can be here. Yeah. All right, so the House um, proposal of um, amendments, we have three to consider this afternoon. And the um, and this goes. I'm sorry, Damien. How would we handle the um, what, the one that we also didn't have because I think it was this conversation. How do we? What is it that has to be deleted if we were to consider the um, moving from combined 16 weeks back to 12 individual? That's that's the one we don't have on the paper. That's that's not the not ready for prime time one. That was another one. But we have that already. One of drafts, you already have it. So. Uh, I, I actually have not drafted that yet, but it is uh, literally, it just means that on 575A1A, 
I delete everything after the comma. Right. So it's, very, it's a very simple change. Okay. That was just that you would ask to see that, and yep. I just didn't. We just it, it slipped through. So the first one. Um, Notice. Is, is the notice requirements. So as Damien testified, there was a thought that the, um, the thoroughness of the notice requirements hadn't been, had slipped through the cracks in the bill. So that um, basically what this will provoke, well, Damien, can you read it? Just, that'll be the easiest in the first case. Can you, can you just read what you, or talk us through what we did? Sure. So uh, the notice requirement here, there's two things. This would add a new section to the paid family leave law requiring employers to post notice in a conspicuous place um, of the uh, provisions of the, the new paid family leave law on a form provided by the Commissioner of Labor. Uh, and then it would also require the employer to provide a printed notice of the provisions to new employees within 30 days after the date on which they are hired. That could actually be changed to a written notice. But, um, and then the second piece here, the education and outreach. So we already have a timeline for the Commissioner of Labor to develop information and materials related to the program. So this adds a model poster and pamphlet providing notice of the provisions of the law uh, to those requirements. And then it requires, uh, within a month of that being prepared, employers have to provide a copy of either the model poster or the pamphlet um, to each employee who is employed on the date that that notice was, uh, the deadline for publishing that notice. So that covers all current employees and then going forward all new employees will get notice plus it should be posted so people will know what their rights are and we felt like this was a, a technical change that, that this is the kind of notice we give Thank you. for programs mm -hmm. um, and we did a similar thing for paid, sure. for paid sick days yeah. uh, yes you can post but be careful that you only post the ones we're talking about okay um, Faith, uh, Faith, these are the ones to not post. To not post. Uh, <laughs> but we are posting this. Yes. yes. So on B, is that envision that each employee is going to get a copy of the model poster? Uh, it would be a model poster or um, an or a pamphlet of choice. Um, that could also be changed to just the employer shall provide written notice within 30 days and then the employers can do it however they want. Email, copy of the poster prepared by labor. The other thing is you could provide that it's just a model poster for labor so they don't have to provide two things. Um, there is one law where labor is provided both. They're essentially identical, just uh, one is in multicolored format and the other is in a traditional poster list. So, um, but I just, I went broad and we can mm -hmm. always bring it back. So but it is, we want this post, this model poster to be posted, right? Right. right. And that's, that, well, that, that exists in the bill. So right? the, we typically, labor typically prepares a model poster. Employers are not required to use the model poster, um, but they can if they want. So the model posters out there, as we discussed earlier, a lot of employers will pay for a service that updates all of their posters and provides a laminated color copy um, that they can post each year. So, um, but then other smaller employers or employers who are trying to save a little bit on expenses mm -hmm. will print out the model poster from labor. And this. Um, if we're going to the effort to make sure that all new employees are notified in a written fashion, might we not also set, set the expectation that this is incorporated into employee handbooks? Or is uh, that just assumed? I think that's assumed. I mean, okay. I mean, I, I mean, I'll use personal experience. My son worked at a local gas station, and even the local gas station had an employee handbook. Uh, it's a convenience store. Um, so, but but failing that, it's a notification that they're you know that they're notified within the first thirty days of their employment. Um, and, and this was important to go beyond, to me and to us, the House, to go beyond just the 
poster aspect of things because it right. gets lost. And, and given the fact that if we are settling, um, even if it's not, if it's mandatory or voluntary TDI, um, that employees deserve to know that sure. this is available. Is, yeah. there, is there any reason why B just can't say written notice? Yes, that's what B Danny on page two. Yep, yeah. page two. Yeah. Danny, on page two or B Shall on page Shall provide written, on page written two. notice as line opposed ten. to model poster or pamphlet. Oh, line Just ten. Just to make it clear that they line have. Line 10. What are you no, we're on page. Oh. Line five. I thought, on the I'm second on, page. There's two Bs that there say print. two Bs. Yeah. Right. right, I said printed. page two. I think Damien had suggested that instead of printed, he would say written on line 10. That's right. Page one. And wherever else the word printed is used. That's fine. Model po you can change model poster or pamphlet to written notice. Written so notice. I think what um, Senator Ballant is getting at is if you look at page two, right. lines three to five, it said shall provide a copy of the model poster or pamphlet. And you could just change that to written notice of the provisions of subchapter, et cetera. That's satisfactory to me. Um, and then on the front, you could change printed notice to written notice. Um, is that satisfactory? Any problems, Mr. Chair? No. So say the word. Um, and just with respect to the uh, employee handbook piece too. It's just worth noting that a lot of employee handbooks will just say the the company follows the state law with respect to exactly. right. and then just list it and rather than going into all the details yeah. um, because oftentimes the law changes in the employee handbooks are uh, outdated. Are, yeah. yeah so to keep them from being outdated it's it's simpler to just say we follow the state law. Okay, enough on that proposal. Right. Um, let's move to uh, audit language. Damien, all yours. Yep. We have audit language already. This is just to clarify what would appear in, in the audit and how it would be reported to um, the so relevant the, committees. Audit, the audit language was in the Senate version, but not the House version? Yes, yeah, so the audit language was added in the Senate, uh, and then this builds off of the language added by the Senate. So, what was, uh, what was the language that the Senate had? The Senate language was if you take the first sentence, the insurance carrier shall have its books and financial records related to the provision of family and medical leave insurance pursuant to this subchapter audited annually. And then it said, um, and the Commissioner of Financial Regulation and shall provide a copy of the annual audit to the Commissioner of Financial Regulation after that. So the second sentence in 7A is entirely new. And then after Commissioner of Financial Regulation in 7B, that is new. So the new sentence in 7A provides that the audit shall also include detailed information regarding the number of claims submitted the number of claims that were denied, the number of claim denials that were overturned on appeal, and any changes in those amounts um, uh, with respect to the prior year. So, so do, do either of you know, I assume that this is in some ways boots and, sus uh, yeah, boots and suspenders in the sense of belts and suspenders. Belts, belts. In the belts sense, are useful too. In the, in the sense that this seems like pretty commonplace stuff that you would be looking for in an audit. Right. So I'll let the house kind of talk about that. Yeah, so um, kind of reading the, the language that you all had of books and financial records, kind of books could be a lot of different things. And so wanting to be clear that the audit was included the financial health of the uh, company and the processes that they were doing as an insurance company, but then also what were they doing with the claims, um, and how how are they? How many claims are coming in? What's their um, claim return rate, and uh, and all of that? And so having having us be clear that that is what we're asking for, and then having it be clear that we can get um, as committees of jurisdiction can get oversight as well, um, of getting a summary of that, so that we have that oversight often. And that second part is in subsection D. 
requiring the Commissioner of Financial Regulation to provide a summary of the audit results to uh, House Appropriations General and Ways and Means and Senate Appropriations Economic Development and Finance. So tracking our RBA, I, I would like to see it not just the number of claims, but by category mm -hmm. and the duration of the claim. So because we want to I think we want to, particularly for the first couple of years, really get a sense of which Who's of these categories them? are being taken, uh, which are being used most, mm -hmm. how long are people uh, needing uh, mm -hmm. to deal with each of those, and um, yeah. So I would, I would, numbers isn't enough for me. I would rather we discuss this with the previous in the Senate, but by category and by and by yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Third, the third is um, House proposed changes to the reopener um, language. Looks good. Thank you. And that, Damien, is just what? Is, what are the additions to this, and what's in the bill? Already? So, uh, I after the words on line six, after the words in the event the General Assembly enacts legislation, um, and originally it said requiring mandatory uh, leave for the employee's own illness or something to that effect. Now it says amending the provisions of Chapter 5, Subchapter 13 of this title. Um, it should actually just say of this subchapter. Um, but that's a drafting error. Um, or any other statutory provision related to the Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program that the contract has to require the commissioner and the insurance carrier to reopen the agreement to make any amendments that are necessary to ensure the agreement continues to comply with the law. So that, is that just, can I consider that just a larger included but not limited to the, in this case, I mean the mandatory language was in there. But this so encompasses they, mandatory but it can, it can include any scheme that the, the legislature decides to Right, so for example, if the legislature decided to change the appeals process um, or to require the insurance carrier to um, provide notice or training or something like that, this could allow the agreement to be reopened to address those issues, uh, including funding changes and so forth. Right. And is this is this language that applies to almost any other contract through that that we have um, in terms of how we deal how we deal with um, third parties or whatever? I mean, if we notice that there's a flaw in a contract or a flaw in a process that we've contracted with, do we not have that right? I I don't know. I I can't answer that. Um, state contracts are not my area of expertise. I know with collective bargaining agreements, the parties have to agree mutually to reopen the agreement. And in the contracts that I work with in private practice, typically you have to agree to reopen the agreement. Um, but this, so. is, this, is, this is information instructing that this be a part of the negotiations between DFR so and- um, This has to be a term of the contract. Uh, so this is something that potential insurance carriers that are bidding for this contract will understand is going to be a term if they get the contract. So it's not necessarily 100% locked in. There may be law changes that require the contract to be amended. Uh, and this provision is in there to allow for that amendment. Uh, in that case, without requiring the parties to reach some mutual agreement to reopen the contract or otherwise reach the point where they say the contract, because the law has changed the contract, we can't actually execute the terms of it, so we have to amend it. Uh, and in this case, what this is saying is any time the law is amended, they have to look at the agreement to see if it needs to be amended to keep in compliance with the law, and if it does, they need to reopen it and amend it. So. Yeah. Um, uh, does this, it, does this open the contract only for those amendments, or does it therefore allow the whole contract to be looked at in the event that it is opened? Uh, I would 
think that the parties could, if the parties agree, they can look at any part of the contract and amend it. Um, so, this, I mean, this says specifically this, that are necessary to ensure that the agreement complies with the requirements of the legislation. Right. This, and I'm assuming that's the legislation. This just addresses passed. reopening to First, comply with the right. legislation, mm -hmm. but in, in in any contract, once it's open, the that's what I'm well, I mean, the other thing is the parties can always say. You know that provision we had in around notice, that's not working. We need to amend that language. And then if they agree that that's the case, they can create an addendum to the contract uh, and revise that provision in the contract. Um, so I, I think what you're concerned about is this going to potentially cause problems in the plan because something significant will change. The, the terms of the law are still that the contract has to comply with the law. Okay. And the contract can be terminated if the insurance carrier falls out of compliance with okay. the law. So, um, so that's, that's our protection. That's your protection in there is, is that the, the contract has to include a term in there that provides that it can be terminated at any time if the insurance carrier fails to comply with the law. Is this only <coughs> applicable to the contract between state and the insurance carrier that's going to administer the plan? Yes. It doesn't have anything to do with the equivalent plans that people sign up with? That's correct. Okay. This is just for the, the state's administrator. Okay. Um, the equivalent plans that's between the employer and the insurance carrier. And that's what we have for right now. My yeah, go ahead. So may I just revisit the um, the audit, because I forgot that Carrie Brown was in the room. And I'm going to channel my inner tip only and also ask that we track it by gender. Uh, that we do by category, length of leave, and by gender. Go ahead. Um, so then if, I think if we're getting specific on demographics, then we should um, include demographics, uh, because also looking at what are the uh, race categories that are being included or denied, um, and uh, in terms of age, if that's if that's helpful. Um, so I don't know if there's another, right now there's another demographic that jumps out for me, um, but that that would also be very clear if there were disparities or discrimination that was happening from the insurance company if we tracked those two additional demographics. The only thing I would point out here is the insurance carrier may not have all that information. Mm -hmm. So, um, or it may be revealing of individuals, particularly if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at race in, in particular, and if there's anything else that's attached to it, it might not be able to be anonymous. Um, so, there would be something that would need to be in there as well. And and I just question, you know, our roles here about. What can we do now, given the parameters that we're working with, and um, which th I think this can fit, given that we've already you've already proposed an audit, um, and what can we revisit as we move forward in you know even in this session in terms of I, uh, I definitely agree with that. I, I don't want to go too far on some of these things without taking any testimony because I'm looking at this last one. And there's a concept in law about interference with contracts. Mm -hmm. And I get a little nervous that the person, if we do hire a private entity to do this, and then the law changes, and then they say, well, we didn't anticipate that in our pricing, and we don't want to have any more part of it, then it disrupts the whole thing as opposed to grandfathering them in until the next contract renewal. But as you say, I think there are things like this we could continue to look at during the session and get witnesses in. And add to the law if the law gets signed. And, and this is something that DFR is, this is their job. Right. You know, this is their, their understanding of, of these. Um, and I see Joyce leaving. Um, <laughs> thank you. See you in the morning. <laughs> so if we, if we, so right now the way that this, this the reopener language stands is that we, I mean, are we, we're, we're on reopener. 
we go back to reopening. Oh, but we went back to audit. I'm sorry, it took us back to audit just because for me, measuring who takes advantage of this, mm -hmm. um, how, how long they take advantage of it, by what category is of great interest to us as right. we try and serve people. But for the purp I think for the purposes of what we need to do on this bill for this year, I think, again, we can, by the time we, even if we wait until 2021, right, there's time for us, whoever's here, to address this. But I, there's a small list of things that I would like to see if we can add on, not to this, but as an addendum, you know, upon further review that we discuss at a later time that with witnesses that I think we've all had eight, seven months to sleep on this bill and know that it's got some really good stuff and some flaws. And I think we've addressed, this process is addressing some of those. But when we start getting into that level of detail, it may just hold us back for now, but it's something that we would. I actually think the Government Accountability Committee would really support our getting more data, just so I think at least the first two things, length of stay and category, would be very important for us to understand. I mean, I don't care what we include, I just think we need as many measurable. Sure. As possible as we do a new. Sure, no form. disagreement with that. Here. Yeah. I don't have any problems with the suggestion that the Adam made. I saw them getting into getting further in there without hearing from people. Okay. The capability right. is Length and category, okay. I think, are critical. Okay, okay. so <laughs> go ahead. Claims submitted by category, average duration of claims by category, number of claims denied, number of denials overturned on appeal, any change in those amounts. In Comparison to the prior year, but no demographics. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think so. For now, just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I would say we hold off on this one. Which one is that? The reopener. The reopener. Because if you're concerned about the changing the deal. Yeah, I'm perfectly willing to have people in and talk about it, find out if it's not a problem. We can add it later. Which leaves this, which leaves the reopener language as is. It allows us only for, it only allows this provision for moving from voluntary to mandatory if the General Assembly passes um, that change. On TI? This, yes. So that's something, so you're saying if we move to mandatory, that they would change the contract, essentially discontinue the contract, because it wouldn't be. It would reopen, I mean, it, 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 the language that is in you, that is in your version of the right. bill simply says, if the I mean it implies if the General Assembly, which means the House and Senate, have to approve it and it has to become law, right. moves the bill from moves the program from voluntary to mandatory, then the contract can be reopened. This is broader, right. but that's right that now it's only limited to, if I'm not mistaken, it's only limited to. The, the mandatory versus voluntary versus mandatory. Yeah, the required reopening of the contract is just in that scenario. If that's required to be a term in the contract, if the parties okay. agree the contract can be reopened right. in this case, this would change that to the parties agree that the contract can be reopened if any statutory changes amending the law, which would have taken the contract out of compliance are there um, one way to address that? We do this a lot with collective bargaining agreements, is we just say that this law will take effect for the next contract. Um, so and it won't change the contract you're in currently. Right, if we hear, for example, it's going to change a material term of the contract with the VSEA or with the teachers union, a lot of times what we'll say is this change uh, applies from this date and to all contracts entered into on or after that date. So that's just, it seems to me that's just more words and that we can, if we just didn't put this in, that would be the result anyhow. Right, so that's, that's what I'm saying, is if we left it the way it is now, that's probably what you would do for other things that might materially change the contract. Right. Um, that's not to say that the state and the uh, third party insurance carrier couldn't agree to reopen the contract on their own. This would just not force the reopening in those cases. Okay. So, right. So that okay. that also mirrors, I mean, again, the, the the world right now, in the world right now, a, biz, a contract <coughs> can be reopened with mutual um, 
agreement. Yeah, you can always mutually agree to revisit your agreement and potentially adjust it. Um, what you can't do, uh, and what Senator Sorotkin was getting at here, is the state in particular cannot unilaterally change the terms of its contracts um, because they're, it, it's unconstitutional for the state to do that. Putting in the reopener here puts the puts them on notice and makes the term of the contract so they know going in, which is different than the state coming back two years later and saying, surprise, we're going to pay you less money to do this or something like that, which is usually where the contracts clause issues come in is the state agrees to something when times are good, the economy turns south and it tries, and not this state, but um, other states have gotten into trouble when they've suddenly tried to pull back on what they paid to unionized employees or something like that without actually getting agreement from the union to do it. This state, the last time the economy went south, sat down with the union and they negotiated a change um, so that they avoided that issue. Okay, that's um, okay. You know, and we and again we'll have a, a not really. A, hopefully, tomorrow morning will be prime time for this other amendment that we have. Right. And, the, um, and for the Senate amendments. Yep. Let's hear uh, the Senate amendment. Okay. So the in reading over the bill on uh, I think both sides in terms of the equivalency plan, um, we didn't include. This came up from the state employees when we testified. We didn't include the fact that something can add, as many people say, to the value of an equivalent plan if it covers TDI. So there was no um, there was no consideration of an alternative plan providing for TDI in terms of whether it met equivalency to the state's plan. And uh, Damian and I picked that up. Um, that's what the short version talks about. Do you want to explain a little further? Sure, I just want to make sure we're looking at the same piece here. Here. Yep, got it. So um, this piece here, this is where the Commissioner of Financial Regulation reviews any alternative plans. Uh, and then what and, we- and I'm sorry, an alternative plan is the state has a plan that, that, that will be administered by under this scenario, okay, mm -hmm. well, it's not the state run state run plan per se, right? Or it could be, right. I suppose. So there's the state's plan, and, and then uh, and then a, then then my company says, hey, I can buy. Um, my insurance company has offered this product to me um, for this price. Can mm -hmm. I do it? They have to get clearance from the state. Exactly. To to do this. so, they're going to show the brochure and the charge list and the benefits right. list to DFR, and DFR is going to determine whether it's okay or not. Yeah, yeah. is it equivalent or is not? And so what came up uh, when Senator Sorokin and I were looking over this piece is when we've done this in the House, uh, the language was just fine because TDI was mandatory, so reviewing the benefits and the, the length of leave and the cost, uh, that worked out just fine. But under the Senate's plan, you're going to have some employer plans that offer TDI and bundled up, and you'll have others where it's opt-in. And so what this says is in making the determination of equivalency, the commissioner can consider the relative value of any medical leave or TDI that's provided to employees. Um, and then the subdivision cross-reference is the reference to basically the provision that says you have two options. One is to say you can opt in, or the other is to say I'm just going to provide this to all the employees. And so if the employer is opting for the provided to all employees, that'll be considered for purposes of equivalency. So under the proposal from the Senate, um, how do you qualify or quantify the relative value of the voluntary TDI where it's op so if I take it it has value if Deanna doesn't take it it doesn't have value and so what is the mechanism for suffer a for a 
disinterested um, reviewer to say, huh, well, if, if we got, again, the, the plan that's on the table in Twin State is six weeks of this, six weeks of this, six weeks of this, at 60% flat. Yeah. And this plan is 12 and eight and six, but the six is a maybe and the eight's a you know, definite. I mean, all those, yeah. it, and it, those are the prices for this. I mean, how do you, how does that work? It's a good question. So in both the House and the Senate plan, cost to employees is a factor to be considered. I think, I'm not sure it's going to be a scientific assessment. I mean, it's going to be sort of like veggie and Pepsi, throw everything into a black box and come out with the, the product. But I guess these actuaries have ways of doing it. And um, the next provision we're suggesting deals with the issue you're talking about. And that is, um, I, we don't want to particularly upset the state employee contract. And they've got all different moving parts. No cost to them. They have TDI. They got shorter week benefits, and uh, so instead of in that one, we just say instead of doing that full analysis with the potential that it, it could blow up, even though they all agree to it, um, we're saying let's just move on. Let them at least the com the commissioner can say that that's an equivalent plan. And that's what he would have to do in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but all we're really adding here is, in this amendment from what we have, is the, is the TDI, the issues of other relative benefits, the length of the leave, the wage replacement rate, uh, the cost to the, to the employee, those are all complicated factors already in terms of coming up with the equivalency is. But it just seems to be fair that there probably will be plans out there that have, that are like the state plan that includes TDI. So. Yeah. so I guess I see people maybe taking the state plan. What's that? Um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, in s you're trying to capture and lump in the, the potential employee employer offered benefit of TDI when looking at paid family leave. And so say there's there's an employer who offers um, paid family leave of five weeks and TDI of three weeks. Those numbers don't add up, but I'm just trying to get a, a sense of what this proposal is, um, that that would be an equivalent or, you know, again, if those, are, those weeks add up um, to the paid family leave that we're looking at, is that that's the intent of this? So I think the, the way to think about it is, so there's, there's value to each type of leave. Mm -hmm. um, and this is saying if the employer is lumping that TDI in, that value should be considered versus the state plan where your your mandatory value is only the, yeah. the first two. Um, so, and that, I think that that's basically what, what this is looking at and that was left out on the Senate side um, last spring, um, probably just in the, the rush to get things done. That was, I think, something that was just overlooked. So that, that's all this is saying. I mean, we had, a, we had a bunch of senators that came to us and said, you know, are you upsetting existing plans in terms of someone buying into this equivalency? And what they were saying was, what if they have slightly different benefits, nature of the benefits? And uh, so this is what um, we came up with. And uh, it doesn't have to be a paid leave. I mean, it's possible that it could be partially paid by the employer, and partially paid by the employee, then that would be another factor that they weigh in. I mean, one of the things that we looked at in terms of the state employee program that made me think of it is that, as you know, as you heard the same testimony, they got a 0.25 wage replacement if their plan didn't go forward. Right. And under this thing, under our proposal, it's 0.20. So I was thinking if I've got my facts right that they're probably getting a slightly 
better benefit because they're getting states willing to pay them back um, that kind of money if they don't go through. So should we be st sticking our nose into into that contract right now? Well, the, the other thing that that's, that that the SEA proposal has was um, in a classic collective bargaining situation. The state put this plan on the table and the VSEA returned with their cascading issue, which I didn't don't know if you've heard about where they want to be, a, they've wanted to be able to use accrued sick leave to care for family members, which is an integral part of this in which they would be able to get reimbursed at 100%. And so that is that, you know, again, in the classic sense of, of at least the way that the, I understand the way that the contract has been proposed and agreed upon by the union is that um, the language says if this leave plan is implemented, this is what you'll get. If it's not implemented, you get the 0.25%, but, on, but that, that equivalent negotiation pro has also provided them with a backstop of at least receive of, of at least being able to use accrued sick time um, for uh, helping a family member, uh, which is a, a bonus to them. And I, I don't know what limitations there would be on that. I don't know, but the fact that they were able to negotiate that as a, as a union, I think may I mitigate again may may just help alleviate your concerns about about how that might work for them, that it's not just about the increase in salary, but that it is this, op this option that um, they'll, they're able to use their own time. Um, and and, and the, you know, the, 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 the administration's testimony on why they included this is because, of course, new employees don't have accrued leave time to the level that might that, a, that an older employee might have. So well, I, don't, I don't know which way or the other, whether it's better or worse. I mean, if we put it into the black box, I guess we could get a determination, but this is sort of uh, a development that's taken place in the last eight or nine months since we've passed it out, so now we have to deal with it, I think. We just can't say nothing about it. Sure, but is that, are we, are, so is that? That's the second one. That's the second one. Yeah, yeah the first two paragraphs. So the first one is simply for, the first one that you're proposing is simply for regardless of the program that the state um, implements of it on its own accord, someone else still, as a business, still has the option to have a different, which is similar in some respects to what New Jersey does, is that right? Well, I think, I think it was in both versions of the bill. All we're yeah. doing in this one is adding another factor, which is... Yeah, no, I'm just PDI. clarifying that, that this is something that the, 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 having the, the, notion of, the notion of having a private plan. So these companies that already contract with other people, um, and by, by, re by doing the, this alternative plan, this is the part that gives them a waiver that says that they can, that, they're, that they and their employees don't have to pay into the system. Yep. Okay. Cal California and New Jersey both definitely already have this. There may be one or two other states too, but um, those are the two that I know for sure have an alternative plan option. Their language around it's a little different, but they do offer employees the option to get a private plan. Okay. Your question? Yes, I wanted to go back to the state uh, employees plan equivalency, and then uh, we had put in, and the Senate kept in, the very last paragraph on page 55 of the Senate proposal amendment we had put in about an employer that's subject to collective bargaining agreement shall not be required to pay contributions or be subject to the provisions until the effective date of the next collective bargaining agreement. So we, we addressed the union issue at the time. And so I don't know if that actually would have ever addressed the state one or if we have to also say notwithstanding whatever the state, do they have to be connected in some fashion or are they at cross purposes in any way? I don't think they're at cross purposes. Um, the, thank you. Um, the, so this language that was put in last spring um, affected both the state employees contract because April right. 1, 2020 was during the current collective bargaining right. agreement and their agreement wouldn't start till July 1. Right. Uh, 
but there's also other unions in the state right. that are going to be affected. Yes. Um, and Teachers. school districts are on a variety of different schedules. Right. Uh, municipalities, same thing, they're on a variety of different schedules. Uh, and then the other thing is you have any sort of private unions that are under the National Labor Relations Act. They're under a variety of different schedules too. So having this language in here is still probably important yeah, because it's so. going to prevent the unions uh, and the unionized employers from having their contract go out of compliance. Right. Um, and also prevent them from having to figure out, so we owe all these contributions, but we haven't actually agreed who's responsible for them. Right. Um, and so I think that's still important. The new language on the BSEA state plan equivalency, um, I don't think is at cross purposes to that. Okay. Um, because what it provides basically is that They've already negotiated something for the time being. Um, and so that'll be deemed to be equivalent for this first contract go around. And they're not going to be required to negotiate. Um, uh, they're not going to be required to conduct additional negotiations under the law, which says they right. have to negotiate all yeah. this stuff. Um, for that contract. So they, they've already negotiated that contract. They can do it right. for the next one. So so would they revert to the last page when the, the next time they come up for contract negotiations? Uh, would they automatically have to revert to that? Or so are they, we forevermore deeming whatever the state does as equivalent? So the, the way this is worded here, it says the paid family and medical leave program agreed to by the state and its collective bargaining unit that takes effect July 1, 2020 shall be deemed to provide equivalent benefits. That's only been agreed to for the that current one. contract. Okay. Um, and then again, this is the bargaining agreement or the bargaining requirement in mm -hmm. 3BSA 638 that is, is in the law that this is creating. So they're required to bargain with the union on how they're going to deal with family leave each time yeah. through. That's just not applying to the contract that they've already the negotiated. So, so the next time around, the union's free to say, we, we didn't like this. We want 8, 8, and 8. Right. Or we want 70% wage replacement or whatever it is. Uh, and then at that point, they can go through the equivalency. Okay. So, so is that our segue to this? I mean, uh, th that's it, except for the effective dates. Um, yeah, the effective dates, the, I've updated dates in here. Obviously, these dates may change again based on the conversation this morning. Uh, and the only other change in the effective date section is we now have 22 sections instead of 21. So I had to make a change in subsection A to add that section, the new section 21, which used to be the effective date section would take effect on passage, just like most of the rest of the bill. So okay. uh, it, it's not really a material change in that effective date area. It's just Okay, and it's definitely different than what the chart that I sent you. Definitely different from the chart that you sent me, um, but I figure until everything gets ironed out right. with the conference committee, okay. I'll hold off on putting that in. Yep. So, um, Based upon what we talked about today, are you able to do a committee of conference report? We have at least one other issue that we need to talk right. about to decide and potentially insert. Uh, but other than that, um, are, you, are you pretty much there? Right, so let me just confirm what I'm going to be adding to it. Um, and well, and I actually would just like, you know, a few minutes before we break up, just before we agree that we're all, I just want to talk to my my conferees um, specifically and give you an opportunity to talk about the amendments that have been presented and um, you know end tonight on a to be continued note. But I just I don't want to. Okay. But I mean that speaks. I mean Damien, based on whatever we end up with now. For tonight, you can have that. I guess the question is, 
you can have that starting. A conscious report can be formed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let me just see. I hate that word. So the 12 week plan, I should clarify. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think mean, you've got an easy face for it. Okay, so I have removed the 16 week count. Right. Um, the BSCA equivalency, the plan equivalency, the audit language, and the changes to the notice requirements. Those are the five changes. Um, plus, I've already drafted the beginning basis for the conference report with generically just move out all the dates forward one year. So I'll have those highlighted and then we can work through those tomorrow unless you agree on dates tonight. Um, is there anything I'm missing for what would need to go into that? So tomorrow, when we, when we see the next con the next report anyway, I mean, we don't, we, we, Shai pointed out, we, while we, we know that in order to make it 12 weeks and 12 weeks rather than 16 weeks, it requires just a deletion. Right. But we will see that on paper when we see the... You'll see that. It, is it all right with the committee if I do the conference report as a strike on? Um, does that work for everyone? Or would you like to see instances of amendment? Because there will can, be can we dozens not? of them. There so, will be dozens of them. Yeah, with all the dates. Oh, yeah. Um, I think a strike all well, easier. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. I agree. Let me just understand. So, if we did House of Seeds yeah. to yeah. the Senate version with the following amendments, you're saying, because right now we don't have that many, and as opposed to something appearing on the calendar, except I don't know what the all the amendments on the dates were that. You have to bring in every section and all this stuff, and then it becomes really long. I'm interested in brevity. If, if we can highlight the changes in a conference that way, as opposed to what, handing out a all. bill. Why, why don't I try to do instances of amendment? See, it'll it take a little longer to draft, but I, I mean, ultimately, the length will be shorter. There will just be, and you're going to have a lot of instances. And it will also of highlight the five changes mm -hmm. we're making, as opposed to but if we were, it, I'm just thinking out loud, I mean, my concern with just only having the amendments is that it's been a while since people have seen the whole bill. Right. And so if there's, if the whole bill appears in our respective calendars, then it gives people an opportunity to read it cover to cover. And then if the con, I mean, what we have to present is, the, are the instances, I mean, I would simply say, this bill is roughly the same as it was last year, except, yeah, and then easy. make them, and then go point to point. I mean, that would be a report that I would get from them. I wouldn't have to go, I mean, I would go through a substantial portion of the bill in general, but I would highlight the changes. We would be able to highlight the changes. What's the best way to I, go that way? Okay, so I, this is the way I think, and I'm willing to defer. Um, for you guys, it may make more sense to do a full bill because we sent you over something that we already voted on, right? and we're making just five changes to that bill. You know, we had a lot of agreement at the end of the year of what we sent you over there, but maybe your full body are not aware of all those changes, so maybe you. Oh, want I to think see that's it. That, that's an accurate statement. So maybe you want to see it. I just I I prefer I could get up there and say you know these are the changes we made for what you already voted on, yep. and be done. <laughs> I agree, and I and I think in this case on a bill that's just important. I think it's a, I think it's important given the time difference between the two, that just just to give. I, mean, I don't mind like leaving I say, a few I'll branches defer, on a tree I'll to provide people guys. the opportunity to read the whole bill again. If if we're they have um, this is a conference report. There will not be further amendments that people have to have an opportunity to voice their support or opposition to what we've agreed upon. So I just, right. yep. I'm just, I'm just trying to um, adhere to uh, more information in this particular case will be better than less. And, you know, I mean, I'm assuming that we need to so, I, Don't say it out loud, Michael. Don't say it out loud. <laughs> so I'm going to write him in, in a rare move. I'm writing him in. <laughs> so, so what I can do is prepare a strike all amendment. Then I can also prepare an outline that says in right. section X right. these That's changes right. were made. That's right. in that section, would be perfect. Which is roughly what you do for any yeah. bill. Right. 
I think that for the house. <laughs> they're just usually yes. not upon our budget. Yeah. Well, the um, bills, but, but yeah. yes, I mean, but you're, I'm, I'm not concerned with, I'm not asking you to, we're asking you to do more work, but also, um, so, so for, so can you, if we can take, if we can take five minutes now, so, just a five minute break. So can you just go back to what you just said? I thought actually, they didn't thought that a strike call would be simpler for him and would be better for you, which I yes. think it would be, quite honestly. Yes, right. That's where we are. And okay. then he, we, but then he would present us with, with I mean, when we ask Damien for a bill synopsis that builds the foundation of any floor report that we do, okay. Damien, Damien will basically give us this. He's up, that he's already done. Yeah, yeah. With a, you know, okay. some, some changes. There's some right? way of changes. But perfect. perfect. And, we're, and we're older now, so bump up the font. Um. <laughs> yeah, at 18, could we request 16 or 18? No, there's 16 or 18. Well, there's probably hey, I have a new eye. I am like, like the bionic woman. <coughs> so if we can take five minutes before okay. we adjourn. We'll leave you here. We'll go to another room. And uh, actually, we were going to go across the hall. because has got a room. I, 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 I got a room? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you need me or do you want to? Um, we are uh, fine with the uh, proposals that you put forward and with the language and with the amendments to the amendments that we've made. So we will see what appears tomorrow morning okay. and We're continue fine. on with the uh, job qualification with the employee qualification language tomorrow and um, and then the dates of of the. Specifically of the um, all of it. Well, the oh, RFI, RFP, the, when, it, when it becomes available. Right. So that's that was the major question in terms of other dates outside of what, and then that might affect effective dates all the way through. But um, mm -hmm. we it can does. talk about that with a fresh Good. brain. Thank you. I'd Thank like you. a fresh brain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm actually. Uh, why don't we? Um, so I'll probably. Answer. Look for you in the cafeteria, uh, and I will. Eight thirty tomorrow morning.